tucked away right at the back of the New Testament. This tiny little letter. Am I on? You want to hear me? Tiny little letter by Jude. It's Jesus' brother, half brother. And it says this Dear friends, although I was very eager to write to you about the salvation we share, I felt compelled to write to you and urge you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to God's holy people. This morning, is this is the receiver? Here we go. This morning, I'm talking on a topic that I never thought I'd have to actually address, um, but it's one that has come to our attention in recent times because it's created a bit of discussion uh, in some circles. It's, it gets kicked around uh, every few years about the Jewish feasts. Are they applicable to Christians today? Do the feasts that are pointed to Jesus coming are they something that Christians need to continue? to celebrate and focus on today. And there's been a lot of uh, email discussion back and forth. There's a lot of websites that talk about this stuff. And so this is actually sort of a part two of my earlier presentation a fortnight ago. You were here, those of you who were, you may remember. We we examined the topic, who is the Israel of God? And we established that the Israel of God today is believers in Jesus anywhere in the world. They constitute the, the Israel of God, the, the nation of, of God, the kingdom of God. And so we want to look at the subject this morning of the feasts. <clears throat> because if the feasts were applicable to ancient Israel, are they applicable to the Israel of God today? And so when we look at a subject like this, we... Um, there we go. I've got to go back. When we look at a subject, oh, there was I've got a little introduction there I forgot to mention to you. It's not, it doesn't seem to be, here we go. This is a place in the Solomon Islands called Arawifi Adventist Hospital. In 2002, I worked there for seven months as a volunteer, as an electrician. Arawifi Hospital was... Established in about 1964 as a mission hospital to the Koyo people who live on the east coast of the island of Malaita in the Solomon Islands. And so I'll give you a map this morning, reference it to where we are. Rocky didn't make it on the map, but at least Townsville's there. So the Solomon Islands, the chain that comes out from Papua New Guinea, you've got um, Bougainville there, and then Oh, maybe my little pointer will work. Is that, is that what they call New Britain up there, Scott? New Britain? Yeah. And then down into the Solomon chain of islands there. That's um, Guadalcanal, the capital of Honiara is there. And then across the water is the island of Malaita. And on the east coast of Malaita is the hospital that our church established in 1964. The Koyo people are, are a fiercely independent tribe within the tribes on the island of Malaita. Uh, very, very warlike people, have a reputation that you don't, you don't mess with them. And they live in a very remote and rugged part of the country. The island's about 100 kilometres long, about 20 kilometres wide at its widest point. And the hospital is, and that area is only accessible by aeroplane, and that's a story in itself, that airstrip was built on a swamp next to the hospital on reclaimed land. It's only accessible by small aircraft, too, I should say, small twin engines, or by boat. There are no roads in this part of Malaita. The the countryside is far too steep, and the annual rainfall is just far too much to establish a road network. So the only way to get to the hospital is by boat. It's in a very remote location. And just up from the hospital in the lagoon, in the harbour there, if you were to sit in a, one of those canoes and turn to your left and look up, you'd be looking at some 2,000 foot high hills. Now, when you come from New Zealand, they're only a hill, but in Australia they call them mountains. But <laughs> 2,000 foot high mountains, virtually rising straight up out of the, out of the sea. Very steep, rugged countryside. Very, uh, 
remote and isolated. And the people that live there have basically been sheltered from any Western influence for millennia. In fact, within a stone's throw, okay, two stone's throws, from the hospital, there are people who still live in the Stone Age, literally. You know, bones through the nose, loincloth thing. Sometimes they come down, sometimes they come down to the hospital only when they're desperately sick. But there are people there who are living a life just as their ancestors have done for thousands of years. I'll come back to Arawifi later on in my sermon. So when we look at the feasts, we need to examine, ask ourselves three questions this morning. What were the feasts? How were they significant? And what do they mean to us today? And if you'd like to turn in your Bibles to Leviticus chapter 23, this is where the feasts are first introduced to the children of Israel. And you will remember when Moses led the children of Israel out of Egypt on the night that he led them out, God reminded them to establish a perpetual memorial of that deliverance from Egypt. And it was known as the Passover. The Passover. Because they had to sprinkle the blood of the lamb on the door, door frames of their homes. And the angel of the Lord went passed over their homes if their homes were covered by the blood of the lamb. And it was to be a perpetual reminder of that event, of their deliverance from Egypt. If you like, it is their national holiday because it was then that they were established as a nation. Leviticus chapter 23. After they come out of Egypt and they're spending some time in the wilderness, God gives them additional instructions because he, they, he tells Moses to get the Israelites to build a sanctuary that he may dwell among them. God wants to dwell with his people. And he sets up, God has um, initiated something for Moses to write down because he wants them to set up a system of national holidays that will point forward to a significant event that is going to take place in their future. We talked about this this morning in our Sabbath school class, that the nation of Israel existed for a purpose. What was that purpose? For the Messiah to come. That was their purpose as a nation. Leviticus 23, beginning in verse 2, uh, verse 1, sorry. The Lord said to Moses, Speak to the Israelites and say to them, These are my appointed feasts the appointed festivals of the Lord, which you are to proclaim as sacred assemblies. He then goes on to say, There are six days when you may work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath rest, a day of sacred assembly. You are not to do any work. Wherever you live, it is a Sabbath to the Lord. Now, the Sabbath is not one of those festivals. The Sabbath is a weekly thing that comes around to all of us. It's a reminder of God's creative ability and for us today, it's a reminder of our Saviour who rested in the tomb over the Sabbath. And is a reminder that, to us of not only our origins, but our ultimate destiny. We have come from the hand of God, and one day he will come again and take his people to be with him. So the Sabbath is not one of those regular feasts. It is a sacred day to the Lord. It is in the Ten Commandments. It is eternal. But the reason that is mentioned there is because the festivals that the Israelites were to honour the Lord with were to be treated like, just like, a Sabbath day. So if one of their festivals fell on a weekday, they were to treat that day as if it were a Sabbath. Verse 4. These are the Lord's appointed festivals, the sacred assemblies, assemblies you are to proclaim at their appointed times. The Lord's Passover begins at twilight on the 14th day of the first month. That is the Passover festival that the Israelites were to celebrate to commemorate their deliverance from Egypt. On the 15th day of that month, the Lord's festival of unleavened bread begins. For seven days you must eat bread made without yeast. And on the first day hold a sacred assembly and don't do no regular work. For seven days... Present a food offering to the Lord and on the seventh day hold a sacred assembly and do no regular work. 
The Lord said to Moses, verse 10, Speak to the Israelites and say to them, When you enter the land I am giving you and you reap the harvest, bring to the priest a sheaf of the first grain of your harvest. He is to wave the sheaf before the Lord so it will be accepted on your behalf. The priest is to wave it on the day after the Sabbath. So on the Sunday. On the day you wave the sheaf, you must sacrifice as a burnt offering to the Lord a year-old lamb without defect, together with a grain offering, two-tenths of an ephah of the finest mixed flour with olive oil, a food offering presented to the Lord, a pleasing aroma. Come down to verse 14. From the day after that Sabbath, the day you brought the, sh the sheaf of wave offering, count off seven full weeks. Count off 50 days up until the day after the Sabbath, seventh Sabbath of the Lord. Sorry, and present an offering of new grain to the Lord. From wherever you live, bring two loaves made of two tenths of an ephah, the finest flour, baked with yeast this time as a wave offering of first fruits to the Lord. Present this bread with this bread, seven male lambs, each a year old without defect, one young bull and two rams. They will be a burnt offering to the Lord, together with the grain offering and the drink offering. Come over to verse 23. Then the Lord said to Moses, Say to the Israelites, On the first day of the seventh month, you'd have a day of Sabbath rest, a sacred assembly commemorated with trumpets, trumpet blasts. Then in verse 26, The Lord said to Moses, the tenth day of the seventh month is the day of atonement. On the fifteenth day, down in verse 33, 34, on the fifteenth day of the seventh month is the festival of tabernacles. It, it begins and it lasts for seven days. In verse 42 it tells us that they are to live in temporary shelters for seven days. So if you like, there's a cycle here. I don't know why this thing sometimes works, sometimes doesn't. It's a cycle here of festivals for Israel. And each of these festivals points forward to a very significant event in their cultural history. Their year, the Jewish year, actually begins the day after the Feast of Tabernacles in the month of Tishri. That's when their year actually begins. Just like we have a calendar year and a financial year and, and a school year, their year actually begins after the Day of Atonement and after the Feast of Tabernacles. That's officially when their year starts. But their first month of the year is the month of Nisan. It used to be called Aviv and after the captivity in Babylon they came back and Ezra the scribe gave the months of the year Babylonian names. And so the names were changed. And the month of Nisan is their first month of their sacred year, if you like. This is the, down here is the first month of their official calendar year. But up here is the first month of their religious year. And that begins with, obviously, the Passover on the, the night of the 14th. 15th, leading into 15th of Nisan. A few days after that, on the first Sabbath after that, on the Sunday morning, they celebrate the unleavened bread. Then they count off 50 days to the Feast of Weeks, seven times seven weeks. 50 days to what we, we today call Pentecost because of the, what took place in Acts chapter 2. In the New Testament, takes them through to sometime early in May. And then it's not until sort of our September time, which is the, the, um, the first day of their 10th month, that they have a, what is known as the Feast of Trumpets. And it's a trumpet sound, a trumpet warning. And in, if you lived in Jerusalem in the old days, the priest would get up on the temple walls and with his big trumpet, it was a big trumpet blast, that would go for quite a few minutes to announce to everybody that the Day of Atonement was only 10 days away. The Day of Atonement, or if you like, a Day of Judgment, was only 10 days away. And finally, 
after that very serious and sombre occasion in their national calendar, after a week later, they would begin to celebrate the Festival of Tabernacles, which was to be a reminder of their days in the wilderness when they lived in tents and they went around in the, as God led them around through the wilderness before they got to the promised land. So there's pretty much a summary of... Now that, and that's, that's the feasts as they appear in the book of Leviticus. And the Jewish people have two more feasts that they have added since throughout their history. One is Hanukkah, which comes in their month of Kislev, which is a, a, a festival that they developed to celebrate the restoration of the temple after... Um, the temple was desecrated by a guy by the name of Antiochus Epiphanes around 165 BC, 165 years before Christ. It was known as the Maccabean Revolt. The, the, the people of Judah revolted against their Syrian overlords, kicked their forces out, their soldiers out, and re-established their authority over the temple and the temple worship in Jerusalem. And so they celebrate that with Hanukkah, or the Feast of Lights. And there's one more that I added in, they forgot to put on this, and that was the Feast of Purim, which comes in the month of Adar. And that was the time when um, Queen Esther in Persia was able to um, work on behalf of her people to seek their deliverance from that wicked man, Haman. And so her uncle, Mordecai, established the Feast of Purim, and it's still celebrated by Jews today around the world. So... There's some important things we need to take into consideration when we look at the feasts because although they were, those instructions were given in Leviticus 23, it was a generation later that would finally go into the promised land. And so in Deuter the book of Deuteronomy, Moses was given further instructions to give to the children of Israel. I want to just pick this up in Deuteronomy chapter 12 and verse 8. I remember they had been wandering around in the desert for 40 years. Moses begins with these words, You are not to do as we do here today, everyone doing as he sees fit, since you have not yet reached the resting place and the inheritance the Lord your God has given you. But you will cross the Jordan and settle in the land the Lord your God has given you as an inheritance, and he will give you rest from all your enemies around you so that you will live in safety. Then to the place the Lord your God will choose as a dwelling for his name. There you are to bring everything I command you, your burnt offerings, your sacrifices, your tithes, your special gifts, and all the choice possessions you have vowed to the Lord. And there rejoice before the Lord your God, you, your sons, your daughters, your male and female servants, and the Levites from your towns who have no allotment or inheritance of their own. Be careful not to sacrifice your burnt offerings anywhere you please. Offer them only at the place the Lord will choose in one of your tribes and there observe everything I command you. And in chapter 16 of the same book, we have these words recorded in verse 5. You must not sacrifice the Passover in any town the Lord your God gives you, except in the place he will choose as a dwelling for his name. So just, just in case you missed the point earlier, a few chapters back, Moses again is told to remind them, you must not sacrifice the Passover wherever you like. You've got to come and do it at the place that God will choose for the dwelling of his name, because we know that was Jerusalem. Three times a year, verse 16, three times a year, all your men must appear before me, sorry, before the Lord your God, at the place he will choose, at the festival of unleavened bread, at the festival of weeks, and at the festival of tabernacles. This was... A command, a divine command. All your males, male, des male descendants within your tribes must appear before me three times a year. The Passover, the Feast of Tabernacles, sorry, the uh, Feast of Weeks and the Feast of Tabernacles. That was their command. So did Israel, was Israel faithful to this? Did they sustain the observance of their festivals all through their national history? Well, I'd like to tell you they did, but we know that they didn't. And in the days of 
King Hezekiah. It's recorded in Second Chronicles, chapter thirty, verse twenty twenty-six. I don't know if the batteries are flat on this thing or not, guys. It's, here we go. In the days of King Hezekiah, because we know from the Jewish national history that they had, whenever a king was faithful to the covenant, times were good. Religious celebrations were held. But when times were bad and there were wicked kings who closed the temple doors, that these festivals did not take place. And in the days of King Hezekiah, the festival of the Passover was once again celebrated. And Second Chronicles 30 there verse actually says that not since the days of King Solomon had Israel had such a celebration. And you know that in, if you were to read back in your Bibles, when, when Solomon dedicated the temple, it was a massive celebration. So not since the days of King Solomon. Second Chronicles 35, 18, a couple of generations later, tells us that in the days of King Josiah, once again, between Hezekiah and Josiah, there was wicked King Manasseh's reign that lasted 55 years. And certainly none of those festivals would have been celebrated during his time. In the days of young King Josiah, once again, the Passover was celebrated. And it says there that not since the days of Samuel the prophet had there been a Passover like this. So perhaps even Josiah's celebration exceeded Hezekiah's, but it was a, a time of rejoicing for the children of Israel. But as you know, as you know, the people of Judah finally went into captivity into Babylon. And amongst those who went to Babylon for their unfaithfulness to the Lord, because Israel and Judah had been unfaithful to God, amongst those who went to Babylon was a young man by the name of Daniel. And Daniel ended up working in the royal palace, first for the kings of Babylon and then for the kings of Persia. And he probably rose to the position of what we would say today as prime minister. And Daniel, Daniel chapter 1, I don't know if this is going to work. There we go. Thank you. Daniel has been in captivity for 70 years. And these are tumultuous times. The Persian army has just come in and captured the city and killed the Babylonian rulers and taken over the entire empire. And Daniel knows that he is living in tumultuous times. And he remembers something that he read as a young man that a contemporary of his by the name of Jeremiah had written 70 years earlier or more. Jeremiah predicted that the children of, uh, of Judah would be in Babylon for 70 years. And so Daniel gets his old copy of Jeremiah's scroll out that he has and he goes searching through, through Jeremiah to find the reference to the 70 years of captivity. And while he's pondering this and wondering about Daniel, Daniel's chief concern and Daniel chapter 9, half of that chapter is taken up with a prayer of Daniel's. His chief concern is the well-being of the Lord's temple because he knows that it's lying in ruins back in home. And there's something else that he knows isn't happening is the sacrifices and festivals and ceremonies of the temple that are supposed to point to the Messiah are not taking place. And that's the burden of his heart. And as he prays, an angel of the Lord appears to him. Now, I need to, I'll, I'll, I need to back up. Around this similar time, here we go, around this time, and, and Daniel chapter 9 verse 1 tells us that in the first year of King Darius, Daniel is searching the prophecies of Jeremiah. A contemporary of Daniel's, a man by the name of Ezra was also, had also understood the meaning of this prophecy. And he had done everything he could to influence the Persian kings to allow God's people to go home again. And Ezra chapter 1, verses 1 to 3 says, In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, in order to fill the word of the Lord spoken by Jeremiah, the Lord moved the heart of Cyrus, king of Persia, to make a proclamation throughout his realm, and he also put it in writing. This is what Cyrus, king of Persia, says. The Lord, the God of Israel, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he's anointed me to build a temple for him at Jerusalem and Judah. Any of his people among you 
may go up to Jerusalem in Judah and build the temple of the Lord, the God of Israel. And that proclamation was recorded on a clay cylinder, etched in, and they, perhaps they would print it off. If they had parchment, they would dip it in ink and roll it up the paper and print it off. Archaeologists have found Cyrus's cylinder with that very proclamation on it. So it is something that we can trust from history, the words of Ezra chapter 1. And in chapter 6, because Ezra, um, amongst the exiles who went back to Jerusalem, they started to rebuild the temple. Have a look at this. Esther, sorry, Ezra, not Esther. Ezra chapter 6, verse 13. We'll pick it up in verse 14. The elders of the Jews continued to build and prosper under the preaching of Haggai the prophet and Zechariah, a descendant of Edo. They finished building the temple according to the command of the God of Israel and the decrees of Cyrus, Darius, Artaxerxes, kings of Persia. The temple was completed in the third day of the month of Adar in the sixth year of the reign of King Darius. So it's only six, five and a bit years after Daniel had read the prophecy about Jeremiah. And so once again... They re-established. In verse 19, it says, On the 14th day of the first month, the exiles celebrated the Passover. And this was a time of national rejoicing because at last they were back home. The temple was rebuilt and their festivals were underway again. And there's, there's Ezra encouraging the people with his reading of the law about that time. And Daniel 9, the same vision that Daniel had, um, sorry, the same chapter that Daniel, Daniel said his prayer, he was given a vision where an angel of the Lord came to visit him. And the angel actually told Daniel, Daniel 9.27, that there would be 70 sevens of weeks, or 490 years, before the Messiah would come. And in the last week of this prophecy, in the middle of that last week, he said, the Messiah would put an end to sacrifice and offering. And I shared with you a fortnight ago the fulfilment of Daniel's 490-year prophecy and how the life of Jesus fulfilled that to the letter as accurately as anyone possibly could have predicted. In the middle of that final week, Jesus died on the cross for you and I. You see, the very festivals that pointed to the one, the very prophecies that pointed to the one, were fulfilled when Jesus died on the cross. So let's have a look at, at some of those. And Luke's Gospel tells us that on the afternoon that Jesus died, the curtain in the temple was torn from top to bottom by an unseen hand. And that is a very significant event because that tells us that something that was once hidden has now been revealed. Something that was once a barrier between God and his people has now been removed. Something that stood as a part of all those symbols that pointed to the Messiah, that those days are finished. Sometimes this works and sometimes it doesn't. Here we go. And of course the good news was even though Jesus died on that Friday afternoon and the, and the veil was torn in two in the temple, the good news we know as Christians is that on that Sunday morning he rose again from the tomb. And in the New Testament tells us that 50 days later, and remember, I'll come to that in a minute, 50 days later a very special event happened for, to Jesus' disciples and followers as they waited in an upper room in Jerusalem because the Holy Spirit came down upon them in what appeared to be tongues of fire. This was the day of Pentecost. This was the Feast of Weeks. And Acts chapter 2 tells us that there were Jews in Jerusalem that day from all over the Middle East. Why? Because they were there for the Festival of Weeks. They were commanded to be there three times a year. Okay, and if I was to represent what those festivals stand for, 
today on a lineal line, rather than the circular calendar, on a lineal line. Perhaps you'll find that there is significance and meaning in the Passover festival, the lamb that was slain. Remember the lamb, the, the, the blood had to cover the doorposts of their home. The blood had to be over them. Jesus was the Passover lamb. When Jesus began his ministry, John the Baptist said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The festival of unleavened bread celebrates the resurrection. I suppose I'll share this with you more another time when we have communion. But when, a, when the Jews celebrated Passover, they had a piece of unleavened bread. At the beginning of their meal, they hid that piece of unleavened bread. At the end of the meal, they bring it out. Just as Jesus was hidden in the tomb over that Sabbath, he came out on Sunday morning. The Feast of First Fruits represents those who rose from the grave when Jesus did on that Sunday morning and they went with him into heaven. Matthew's Gospel records that there was a great earthquake and the bodies of many righteous people came back to life and they walked into the city. Wow, that would have made news. And then finally, 50 days later, we have the Holy Spirit coming down on his disciples on the day of Pentecost. And we would say, well, that's the spring festivals. What about the autumn festivals in the Northern Hemisphere? The autumn festivals, the trumpets, the atonement, and the tabernacle. And I'd like to suggest to you this morning, that's, that's another diagram. You can get, if you, you Google Jewish feasts, you'll find these on the internet, diagrams like this. The Passover, Feast of Unleavened Bread, First Fruits, Pentecost. But what about the, the, the autumn holidays? Well, if I was to show, show it to you as a list of feasts, beginning with Passover, Unleavened Bread, First Fruits, Feast of Weeks, Trumpets, Atonement and Tabernacles, we could say that they represent the crucifixion, the burial, the resurrection, the events of Pentecost, the hour of God's judgment, the trumpets. God never acts in human history without first giving people a warning. And Revelation chapter 14 tells us that God has three angels with a very special message to warn the whole world of the judgment and the coming of the Lord. The hour of judgment. We are in the hour of judgment now. We have a message to proclaim to the world, to every kindred, nation and tongue. Fear God and give him glory for the hour of his judgment has come. The day of atonement, I would suggest to you, is the second coming. Jesus said in John 5, verse 29, The day is coming when at the sound of my voice many will rise from the dead, some to everlasting life and others to everlasting condemnation. Because the day of atonement in the Jewish calendar was a day of judgment. You had to be present and in the community, a faithful member. It was a very solemn week leading up to the Day of Atonement, a time of fasting, a time of personal reflection. Am I considered amongst those who are part of the faithful ones of God? And, following, and finally, the Feast of Tabernacles, the time when we will dwell with God in the New Jerusalem. I'll tell you a little interesting story. 25 years ago, I lived in Tonga, and Tonga is a country that the London Missionary Society went to in the early 1800s. And they were Wesleyan missionaries. And they established the Wesleyan Church in Tonga. It became the, virtually the whole nation, the, the chiefs in Tonga converted to Christianity, and virtually the whole nation converted and became faithful Wesleyan Methodist Christians. In Tonga, they have an annual... Um, Confirmation Sunday that's the best word I can translate it for Confirmation Sunday where you have to be in church on a, that day to be present and when your name is called out that you, your name is kept on the church roll if you're not there your name is taken off the church roll and someone said to me once tongue in cheek maybe we should practice that a bit more often in our church but they had to be present and they have the tradition that all the ladies dress in white on this Confirmation Sunday. Now, this photo is a recent photo because obviously 
hats have come into vogue since I lived there 25 years ago. I didn't remember seeing anyone in hats. But I saw heaps of ladies on this particular Sunday in the year, all dressed in white, all walking down the street and all going to church. And I thought, how beautiful, how quaint. But it was their day of reckoning, if you like. It was their day of accountability. Am I a part of the faithful? Am I among those considered to be in God's kingdom? The book of Acts tells us of a very interesting time in the church's history. Because the early Christian church was made up largely of Jewish believers. But as the gospel started to spread, they started to find that there were Gentile believers who wanted to become a part of this Jesus movement. And as the disciples journeyed around in Judea and Samaria and to regions beyond, they found that there were Gentile people whom God had called and whom God had, had sent his angels to, to tell them to go and find out about this new message of life. And you know the story of Peter going down to Caesarea and he meets Cornelius, the, the Roman centurion, was one of them. And Paul, who was one of the, the church's greatest antagonists, who was converted on the road to Damascus, sets out with his friend Barnabas and they go and visit Jewish synagogues in and around what is modern day Turkey today. And they would go to those places, they would tell them the good news about Jesus and the resurrection and about how he had fulfilled everything that ever pointed to the Messiah. And they would establish Christian groups in each town wherever they went. And as the number of Gentiles, if you like, in the church grew, it brought the church to a position where it had to face the fact that they now had Gentile believers in their midst who were not of Jewish origin, who didn't understand all the Jewish customs. How were they going to integrate these people into their faith? And I would imagine at this time that even these Jewish Christians would have still been celebrating their national festivals because it was just, it was in their DNA. It was just a part of their culture. Acts chapter 15, verse 1. tells us that certain people came down from Judea to Antioch and were teaching the believers, unless you're circumcised according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. And this brought Paul and Barnabas into sharp dispute and debate with them. So Paul and Barnabas were appointed, along with some other believers, to go up to Jerusalem to see the apostles and elders about this question. The church sent them on their way. Uh, da, da, da. Come down to verse 5. Some of the believers, oh, sorry, verse 4, when they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and elders to whom they reported everything God had done through them. Verse 5, then some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees, and I talked about them a fortnight ago, stood up and said the Gentiles must be circumcised and required to keep the law of Moses. And then, of course, the church enters into this um, this general conference session, if you like, where they debate this subject. And Peter gets up and addresses the crowd and says, Brothers, you know what happened to me a few years ago when, when I went down to Caesarea and I met that man, Cornelius. And finally, they resolve that they will no longer... The church does, comes to the conclusion that all those laws and Jewish ceremonies and all those things that pointed towards the Messiah, that they were no longer applicable for these new Gentile believers. Notice verse 24 in the letter. They then drafted a letter to send out to these congregations outside of Judea. We have heard that some went out from us without our authorization and disturbed you, troubling your minds by what you said. And it seems that this controversy was something that dodged, dogged Paul throughout his missionary endeavours wherever he went. Because it was some time later, that's the council in Jerusalem, hardest impression. Some time later, he had to write a letter to a lot of those churches in the province of Galatea, or Galatia, as we would say. Because 
these people who had been going around telling the, these Gentiles, you've got to follow the laws of Moses. You've got to obey those Jewish customs. They had even gone as far as the churches where Paul had travelled. And Paul was inspired to write this letter, the letter to the Galatian churches. I'm just going to pick, up, pick the eyes out of it for you. There's a few verses here. Chapter 1, verse 6. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Jesus Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. Um, chapter 2, verse 15. We who are Jews by birth and not sinful Gentiles know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So too, sorry, so we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law, because by works of the law no one will be justified. In chapter 4, verse 9 to 14. But now that you know God, or, or rather are known by God, how is it that you are turning back to those weak and miserable principles? Do you wish to be enslaved by them all over again? You are observing special days, months, seasons and years. I fear for you that somehow my efforts have been wasted. Paul was faced with a problem where people were going into these churches and saying, you've got to keep a Jewish feast. You've got to keep a Jewish feast. And so they thought, oh, okay, well, if the Jews do it, then we better do it. And the, the whole heart of this letter to those churches that Paul is saying is you weren't saved because you were keeping those feasts. Remember? You were saved because of your faith in the one who hung on the cross for you. He goes on to say so many other places... He says, these people who are coming to talk to you, these people are zealous to win you over, but for no good. They want to alienate you from us so that you may have zeal for them. Hmm, might come back to that. Hebrews chapter 8, a very important little book in the New Testament. Just in case there's any doubt in your mind about this, this subject. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 7. If nothing had been wrong with the first covenant, no place would have been sought for another. For some reason, as we all know, the first covenant just didn't cut it. But God sought place for another. A covenant in which his law would be written upon, not on tablets of stone, but on people's hearts. And in verse 13, it says... By calling this covenant new, he has made the first one obsolete. And what is obsolete and, out, and outdated will soon disappear. Chapter 10 and verse 1. The law is only a shadow of the good things that are coming, not the realities in themselves. And in verse 9 he says, He set aside the first to establish the second. And by that will you have been made holy through the sacrifice of of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And finally, a little letter that Paul wrote to the church at Colossae. I just want to share these verses with you because I hope that it will give you a basis for you to know with assurance that your salvation is found in Christ. Colossians chapter 2, verse 13. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave you for all your sins. Having cancelled the charge of our legal indebtedness, and your Bible might say, having cancelled the written code. And for many years, a lot of ink was spilt and a lot of airways were generated trying to defend what is this written code. The Greek actually means... Um, Chirographon, it actually means a handwritten note. And from and Scott will confirm this for me, from extra biblical sources we know that a handwritten note was an IOU. It's a bill of debt. Your bill of debt, what has he done with it? Having cancelled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us 
and condemned us, he has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. Your bill of debt, your sin, my sin, was nailed to the cross. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing them over, over them by the cross. Therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration or a Sabbath day. These are a shadow of the things to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. When he says a religious celebration or a Sabbath day, he's talking about those ceremonial Sabbaths that may have fallen midweek. He's not talking about the seventh day Sabbath, which is a part of God's cre original creation. One of, these, one of these days, this thing will do its thing. Can I have some help, Tabo? Perhaps I've left the best to last, and I hope I have. On the night that Jesus, the last night that Jesus spent with his disciples on earth, he celebrated the Passover with them. It was a very special evening in a very big week in Jesus' life. Luke 22. I want to pick this up in verse 7 to 20. I want to read this with you because I think it's very important that you understand this. Luke 22, verse 7. Then came the day of unleavened bread on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. Jesus sent Peter and John saying, Go and make preparations for us to eat the Passover. Where do you want us to make to prepare for it, they asked. He replied, as you enter the city, a man carrying a water jar will meet you. Follow him to the house he enters and say to the owner of the house, the teacher asks, where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large room, all furnished, make preparations for us there. Verse 14. Oh, verse 13. When they left, they found things just as Jesus had told them. So they prepared the Passover. Verse 14. When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles Reclined at the table, he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfilment in the kingdom of God. And after taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among you. For I will tell you, I will not drink from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took the bread and gave thanks and broke it. And he gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. The hand... Or I'll, I'll pause it there. Jesus was taking those symbols that his disciples would have been very, very familiar with, those symbols that every year at Passover time they would have grown up with since they were little children. The cup of, of grape juice... The unleavened bread, and Jesus gave a whole new meaning to what those things stood for. Jesus was the Passover lamb. There's a quote here I'd like to share with you from the book Desire of Ages. Maybe this will clinch it for you. I hope it does. Christ was standing, talking about the last supper he was sharing with his disciples. Christ was standing at the point of transition between two economies and their two great festivals. He, the spotless Lamb of God, was about to present himself as a sin offering that would bring thus, sorry, and he would thus bring to an end the system of types and ceremonies that for 4,000 years had pointed to his death. And as he ate the Passover with his disciples, he instituted in its place the service that was to be a memorial of his great sacrifice. The national festival of the Jews was to, be, was to pass away forever. The service which Christ established was to be observed by his followers in all lands through all ages. I mentioned to you before that Ardawifi Hospital is in an extremely remote part of the Solomon Islands. And that the difficulty of getting to it by land or sea means that getting foodstuffs to this part of the world is a very, very expensive commodity. This is down at the local markets held on a Wednesday morning down on the wharf. People who live all around that harbour get in their little dugout canoes 
having harvested the produce of their gardens the, the, the afternoon before, and they gather on that wharf, as they, as they have done for millennia. Well, the wharf wasn't there, but they, they gathered in that central spot, as they have done for millennia, and they barter the food that they have out of their garden, usually with people who have been out fishing. The fishermen come in with their catch, the people who have the gardens come and trade veggies for fish. And now, with the presence of the hospital there, of course, there's a, there's a little local cash economy happening, and so now they actually even, they pay for the, the food. They exchange the food and they also pay for the food. But getting food, the sort of food that you and I are used to, going into the supermarket and get off the shelf, to getting food stuffs like that in a place like that is extremely expensive, extremely expensive. So even for those people, if they were to become Christians, even for those people, to procure a bottle of grape juice that you and I take for granted every quarter when we celebrate communion, to procure a bottle of grape juice for them is the equivalent of a day's wage, probably more. To get some flour there that isn't full of weevils and mice droppings and goodness knows what else, and Amy's laughing. She knows what I'm talking about. To get some flour there that you can make some unleavened bread with after you've sifted all the weevils out of it and all the mice droppings out of it. To get some flour there. To land a sack of flour there is a very expensive commodity. But they're very dedicated people and they're very willing to do that. There's some local kids that live near the hospital. I want to ask you the question this morning. Does it make sense, when we, t when we th talk about celebrating the Jewish festivals that, that are still applicable to Christians today, there's a couple of things that come to my mind. The first is, so are you still going to do the annual, are you still going to do the, the animal sacrifice that goes with that? It's all very well to bake some unleavened bread, put some grape juice on the table around your home on a Friday night and say, we're celebrating the Lord's Passover. Uh-huh. So where's the spit roast? It ain't happening, folks. Anyone who tells you that they're celebrating the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which goes for seven days, for seven days they need to sacrifice seven year old lambs and a year old bull and a goat or two. It's just not happening. It's not reality. And if you were to tell them that well, it's, it's tied, and, that, and their argument would be, well, it's tied to the, the, the agricultural festival of the Jews and, and, and we have to do it 50 days later when, the, when they finally have all their harvest and they, bring in their, the, they begin the harvest with the first sheaf. Yay, we've got our first sheaf of grain. 50 days later, the harvest is over and they celebrate the goodness of the Lord to them in the land. How does a child living on the other side of the world in a different hemisphere celebrate an event that is tied to an agricultural calendar in the Northern Hemisphere. It doesn't make sense. These people do not raise sheep. They do not raise goats. They do not have cattle. How can they possibly celebrate a festival to the Lord? I mention this to you because I just want to show you the absurdity of it all. And remember those texts that I've read to you in Deuteronomy, that you're not to celebrate it wherever you live, wherever you like. It had to be celebrated at the place the Lord would choose. And it had to be sacrificed in Jerusalem at the temple. So for Christians today to say that the festivals of the Lord are still applicable, are living in la-la land, they really are. The book of Galatians closes the verse, Paul says in verse 14, May I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Peace and mercy to all who follow this rule, even to the Israel of God. Jesus instituted a ceremony that is applicable for all Christians in all ages in all lands that reminds us of the great sacrifice that he has done for us.
This is the ceremony that you need to celebrate. And we do it once a quarter here in this church, in the Evidence Church. We're not sure whether we should just do it annually. It just doesn't seem enough. And we don't do it every week, so it becomes so common. And so we've chosen over the years to celebrate it quarterly, to remind us of the promise that Jesus made, of what each of those symbols stand for. And Jesus said that he would not drink again of the vine until he came and celebrated it with us in the kingdom made new. And I don't know about you, but that's one festival, that's one feast that I'm really looking forward to. May God bless you.